Do you remember when they announced the wildly popular Harry Potter series would be made into a film and a meek little pencil-necked pipsqueak named Daniel Radcliffe was going to be our next great hero? I will turn my dog into a wolf. <laughs> <laughs> That's adorable. But as we find out in the future, you don't need magic to own a wolf as a kid. All you need is really terrible parents with access to internet forums. Hmm, can you keep a wolf with children? That's such a great question, guy who sometimes sleeps next to a wolf. I just wish we had more time to come up with a good answer for you. Instead, I want to look at the story of Harry Potter, because I think we all could have guessed what was coming. A young boy is seemingly frustrated with his current reality. He is soon thrust into a grand new world where he is challenged and tested, ultimately killed and resurrected, and defeats the great evil and returns the world to its ordinary state. You can't tell me you didn't see a version of this coming, because we've all seen this story before and since. It's not that it's predictable or bad, it's because the story of Harry Potter, Star Wars, and Jesus all have something in common. It's the structure of the hero's journey. It's done intentionally, because there's something important here that makes us want to experience the same story with different details, over and over and over and over again. It's what makes us finish one saga and want to start another, even though we know it's going to happen. Experiencing the hero's journey is deeply a part of being human. And what's so exciting about video games is it's an artistic medium that gives us the chance to experience the aspects of the hero's journey that we never were able to through movies or books. As we're going to see, Dark Souls director Hidetaka Miyazaki understands this. And through his understanding, he gives the player the richest version of the hero's journey any of us have yet experienced. So join me, Souls Porpoise, as we take a closer look at one of the greatest game series I've yet played, the Souls series. And in this first part, we're going to see how Dark Souls was not only aware it was putting the player on what is the quintessential hero's journey, but it also implements the tools of the medium, so we actually experience the key elements of the journey. Before we get into what the hero's journey is, let's first talk about the unique quality of video games, because they can do something no other medium can. Art's purpose is to have its audience feel emotion. Films and books rely solely on audience empathy so that they can feel what the characters are feeling. This is why we're scared in horror movies, even though the monster poses no threat to our physical bodies. In video games, it's the same thing. We use empathy to feel what our character feels. That's why we're so unperturbed about our characters who take multiple bullets, because the character usually takes it in stride. Here, Snake takes about four bullets to the chest, and he didn't even flinch, and neither did I. But later, there's a narrative reason to have Snake become physically drained and it's now the player's responsibility to have Snake cross a long tunnel filled with microwaves by mashing the triangle button for what felt like 20 minutes, but was probably closer to five. By the time we reach the end, we feel Snake's stress, his desperation, and his weakness. By understanding this, game makers can use literary devices to not just impact the characters on screen, but to impact the player themselves. To make the player feel actual horror in games like Resident Evil, now our decision-making is responsible for whether or not the character lives or dies. We only have ourselves to blame if we take a wrong turn, run out of first aid spray, or use up all our ammo. Our decisions impact the character's success, and that removes a degree of separation. It has us go from feeling like this, to a little bit more like this. So how do games make us actually feel like we're undergoing the hero's journey? For this question, we're going to need to learn a little bit more about the hero's journey. And to do that, we need only to look to Joseph Campbell. Campbell investigated the fact that across many of the world's cultures appeared a common story, the hero's journey. But he was also interested in explaining why that was. The hero's journey isn't just about making its audience feel like a hero. Campbell believed that the journey was deeply psychological. To be a hero, the protagonist had to undergo a transformation that made them closer to their humanity. They had to overcome their egos, which for Campbell meant they had to see the world in a different way. And to accomplish this, the hero's journey required its most important element, to make the hero undergo trials and revelations. For Simba, he has to realize he's lost his way, and he must now remember who he is. You have forgotten who you are, and so forgotten me. Look inside yourself, Simba. Remember who you are. No! Please! Don't leave me! Hey! Where are you going? I'm going back! And for Luke Skywalker, he has to confront the fact that the Jedi have lied to him about his father. And he must now find a reason, not just from what he was taught, but deep within himself to resist the dark side. Join me, and together we can rule the galaxy as father and son. 
So can we use what we learned about video games to cause the player to actually feel what the character feels? To make the player actually undergo the trials and revelations of the hero? To make them overcome their egos, and through doing so, become a little bit closer to their humanity? How can we go from this, to this, to this? I will not fight you. Well, that brings us to Dark Souls. And to accomplish this, Dark Souls has us undergo the script that Joseph Campbell and those he inspired outlined. But we're not going to talk about all of these steps in this video, but rather the first five, because these are the most important. They're the initiation of the hero and thereby the initiation of the player. And all of them occur in what Campbell referred to as the ordinary world. In this case, it's the tutorial of the game, the Undead Asylum. Step one is the ordinary world. For our avatar, this is the status quo. And when we're introduced to them, we find them in a jail cell awaiting the end of the world. But something's off. They're not quite the character we created. Instead, they have their signature rotten, purple complexion. Just think about what this did for our motivation. We spent several minutes in the character generator. And so now we know our character isn't whole. We're now painfully aware, just like our characters, that we're missing something important that's outside the cell. And whatever it is, it will give us back our identities. And after realizing this, we have just undergone the next step, the call to adventure. But before we can answer our call, we need to experience something that's all too important for the hero. Self-doubt, to feel that we are not up to the challenge ahead of us. This can come in the form of reluctance, hesitance, or even certainty that we aren't good enough. This is called the refusal of the call, and it's the next step in our journey. To feel destiny must be mistaken, that we lack the required skills of a hero. After all, the hero comes from pretty mundane beginnings. I mean, it was only yesterday that he was just some pipsqueak who used the bullseye womp rats in his T16 back home. Uh, yeah, what I said. Now, I admit it sounds strange to desire a feeling of uncertainty in a game that we paid good money for, but that's exactly what we're after. The point of the refusal is for the hero to think they're not up to the task ahead of them. And after being reminded of their destiny, they realize they do have what it takes. What we want is what Campbell wants, trials and revelations. For the hero to see the world in one way, and then to see it differently. And that's the function of the first real enemy that we meet, the Asylum Demon. Here we are ambushed from above. We have the opportunity to attack with our broken sword, but when we do, we're instantly discouraged by how little impact it has. We're unfit for the fight, and we're clearly trespassing. There's something more required from us, whether it be a strategy, strength, or something else. We're given the advice to run and we take it, seeking safety behind the strength of the cramped doorway and back to the jail cells that represent the ordinary world. We're now safe, but we have just refused the call. This is how Dark Souls does the hero's journey better than anything that came before it. We don't watch the character on screen doubt themselves. Instead, the player decides the challenge is greater than they are. This is one of our trials, and if you think that's impressive, Dark Souls goes further, because now it's time for our revelation. And to provide that, we need our next step, the meeting with the mentor. Here, the hero is given the mission, along with sage advice or divine gifts. Our mentor is Oscar, who tells us to carry on after him and ring the bell of awakening. And with that, he offers us the tool that we'll use for the rest of the game. Not a weapon that we'll decide isn't for our build, or a piece of armor that we reject for the same reason. Instead, he gives us the Estus Flask. This is his divine gift to us, our device of empowerment that we'll come to rely on. Now let's look at this in depth, because this is the most important mechanic in Dark Souls. For Campbell, he thought of the Divine Gift as the Mentor's way of giving the hero a psychological commitment. In Star Wars, the Mentor gives the hero a unique weapon that requires him to learn the secrets of his sacred lineage in order to properly wield it. Father's lightsaber. This is the weapon of a Jedi Knight. In The Matrix, the Mentor offers Neo something as simple as a choice. And this has everything to do with how Joseph Campbell viewed the gift. The journey that Neo was about to accept in the red pill blue pill scene was one of liberation. He was to free himself from the false reality that kept him distracted and gain control of his life for reasons that only other humans could understand. Do you believe in fate, Neo? No. Why not? Because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. I know exactly. What do you mean? And liberation from the system starts with the very symbol of liberty, having a choice. The very thing the mentor presents to him, and what Campbell would call the basis of Neo's psychological commitment. I know. Smart, right? It almost makes you want to forgive the Wachowskis for Jupiter ascending. Now bees are genetically designed to recognize royalty. Eh, 
I did say almost. And just as it's important for these well-recognized heroes, the S's flask is important to us, the player, the hero. The formula comes down to two factors. In the game, exploration is central to our success, offering knowledge of traps, treasures, and shortcuts. But we can only improve our exploration incrementally. Each run, we preserve more and more of the S's flask until we no longer rely on it. Eventually, we start to memorize the map, knowing everything there is to know about a bonfire's surroundings. The Estes Flask serves as a cushion between our desire to explore and try new things, and the harsh penalty for doing so. In other words, it's the thing that allows us to explore the world of Dark Souls. And through exploration comes mastery. That's why the Estes Flask is so important to our success. This moment where we believe that we don't have what it takes to take on a boss is going to happen again, whether we have strong weapons or weak ones, like our broken sword. But the Estes Flask affects the player's determination. The Estes Flask is a tally of how many mistakes we've made on a certain run, and the fewer mistakes we've made, the more charges we have. Ever find yourself seeing how many charges you have left before you decide you have what it takes to beat a boss? That's the side effect of this gift. It's the thing that returns the player to his or her psychological center. It signals that their skills have improved enough, and they are equipped with all that they need to defeat this challenge. Use the force, Luke. Let go, Luke. Fighting the Asylum Demon the second time, we now know we have what it takes to conquer this world. A weapon and our very human ability to learn from our mistakes. And with this, we are now ready to conquer the Threshold Guardian, the test that determines whether or not the character is ready to cross the first threshold and enter the special world. What's fascinating about the Guardian in this situation is it doesn't test our character, but rather the player's skill. It assesses that we, not our character, are ready to attack the larger problems that come after this moment. And we know this because a key aspect of an RPG is leveling up with experience points, or in Dark Souls terms, our newfound souls. But this bonfire, before we get to Firelink, won't let us level up. The challenge of the Asylum Demon is the standard for what's to come when we reach the special world. The time to run and prepare is over, and upon passing this test, we will know we are equipped with all we need. And after defeating the Asylum Demon, we, not our characters, are ready for the special world and all that comes after it, including the other steps of the hero's journey that succeed the first five steps once the hero leaves the ordinary world, where we delve deep into the literal abyss and conquer what can consume humanity, where we meet with the goddess and atone with the father, and so on. But none of them really affect us on the psychological level like the first five steps do. For Campbell, the journey was about confronting a system. That system would have the hero do one of two things. The first is what almost all games allow us to do, to use our humanity to not break the system, but win within it. This is the key to what makes video games an ideal medium for the hero's journey. Games provide us with a system, a set of rules that we have to figure out and exploit to use to our benefit. And Dark Souls has definitely figured that out. But here's what makes Dark Souls unique. The other possible outcome was for that system to break the hero and rob them of their humanity. For Luke Skywalker, is for him to betray his morals and seek the power of the dark side. For Harry Potter, it's to sacrifice the well-being of society to undo his tragedy. For Jesus, it's to betray his divine duty in exchange for ruling the world. For the Dark Souls player, it's to find his or her task too difficult and give up. While Dark Souls is one of the most brutal games out there, I think this is why those of us who have finished it hold it so dear to our hearts. We die, and we die a lot. But there's no limit to how many times we can die. The only thing that determines when our game is over is when we say it is. Dark Souls tries to use the system to break us, and our refusal to let it overwhelm us is how we win within that system. As we learn from Dark Souls, the story, just like the hero's journey, is based on a cycle. And I think that's why we're so eager to keep coming back to it. Just like we might have known the sequence of events in Harry Potter, and we likely know the sequence of other upcoming stories, it's not about seeing how they end. Joseph Campbell thought that it was a distraction to focus on whether or not the journey was a just cause. He explains this by offering a popular motif of a hero returning from the fire with gold, and when the hero opens his hand, the gold turns to ash. For Campbell, the journey was a deeply psychological experience, and that's where the real value lied. Not in the treasures, not in the duty, but the hero better understanding his or her humanity. It's about experiencing the journey, whether that experience just be through empathy or through actually enduring the trials and revelations. In the same way, Dark Souls doesn't have any big plans for us. We even have good reason to think that our actions in the first game didn't really matter in the other games. But it's not about that. Dark Souls, unlike other games, doesn't have his play as the hero who saves the world. It has his play as a hero. And as far as Joseph Campbell was concerned, that's all that mattered. 
Like the character that returns from the fire with gold that turns to ash, our character is also consumed by fire. It's trapped in the game world, with all the treasures and powers that they acquired, and that player returns to his or her ordinary world, knowing a little bit more about themselves, and just a little bit richer from the experience. No! You can't keep a pet wolf with children. Oh hey! Thank you so much for watching! And look, all I want to do is see you again, so please subscribe! I'll just sit here patiently waiting for your return. If you're looking for more on the Soul series, I'll have a video up here as soon as possible. And also, make sure to check out Joseph Anderson's brilliant channel, another YouTuber who discusses the Soul series and does critical analyses on games. Tell him I said hi. See you guys next time.